There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse number 5, Jesus said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, <laughs> stop just a moment. That's the hardest part of prayer right there, shutting the door. That's, that's the hard thing for us. We live in a noisy world. It's busy. It's distracting. The pull, the push, the pressure of it all. I know it's Sunday. Easy to think about spiritual things on Sunday. Then Monday rolls around. School, work, and you say, well, is it possible? Oh, yes, friends. It is possible that every day, any day, you can meet with God. But if you're going to do it, you're going to have to shut the door. You're going to have to close out some things. Watch this. Get this mental picture in your mind. Here's what prayer is. Prayer is shutting the door on the world for a little while and letting God open the door to heaven. Let me ask you a question. Uh, which, which side, which one of those doors you think has better treasures behind it? I guarantee you the Lord's door has much more behind it. But you got to get this door shut. So he says, you shut the door and then pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You see all these repeated references to the Father in this passage. I think it's like 189 times in the gospel records God is referred to as the Father. It's very unique. It was very unusual for even the hearers of Jesus' day to hear such a thing. Look, you, you, you understand why Jesus could call God Father. He's the only begotten Son. But in this passage, he turns the thing around and he says, No, no, he's not just my Father. He's our Father. He's your Father. Remember when Jesus came out of the grave and he appeared to Mary in the garden? What did he say to her? Go tell the disciples. I'm going before them to Galilee. And he said, but don't touch me. And listen, this is precious. He said, because I have not yet ascended to my God and your God, to my Father and what? Your Father. How many of you are glad that the Father of Jesus is your Father? Mm. Verse 7, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Did you notice, mark this in your Bible, in verse 5, he refers to the hypocrites, and in verse 7, he refers to the heathen. Both of them equally are negative examples. The, the hypocrites, that's the religious people who think they're really praying, and then the heathen who don't even know God, don't know how to get in touch with God. He said both of them are off base. You can be a worldly sinner, you can be a religious sinner, but either way, if you're not coming to God as the Lord shows us, then you're living in sin and not in obedience. Verse number 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. You know, I was, I was thinking this week, I think sometimes our prayers are just a whole lot of words. It's just a lot of words strung together. Pardon me. It's a lot of religious cliches, all connected. And if you pray sanctimoniously enough, then it's really prayer. But is it? How many of you remember Charlie Brown's teacher? That's a spiritual note, isn't it? You remember Charlie Brown's teacher? Wah, 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 wah. It was just, 
just noise. There was no clarity to it. I think sometimes in heaven, it is not that God cannot hear. Is, is the Lord's hand short that it cannot save? Is his ear heavy that it cannot hear? No, no, no. That's not the problem. The problem is never with him. The problem is always on our end. Oh, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we come to the model prayer. Would you read verse 9 down through verse number 13 out loud with me, church? Let's read it together, beginning in verse 9. Ready? After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the temptation is to think, well, he's finished with that. But amen is just the end of the prayer, not the end of the lesson. 150 times, I think it is, you find this word amen in Scripture. It's a powerful word. I would encourage you to study it out, but don't miss this, please. At the end of verse number 13, the Lord is not finished with what he's trying to teach us about prayer. And notice the little connector word in verse number 14, for. For if ye forgive men their trespasses. Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then I must tell you, full disclosure, for years I missed verse 14 and verse 15 and its connection to what Jesus was just teaching about prayer. I missed it. And you know, chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. You know that, right? Every word of Scripture is inspired, given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Chapter and verse divisions have just come about in the last few hundred years. Aren't you glad we have it or we'll all still be looking for Matthew 6 right now? So I'm grateful for them. They're a great aid to study. But sometimes you've got to read through the verse. You've got to read through to the next verse, through to the next chapter to get all that God is saying. Anybody remember the old radio commentator Paul Harvey? Now you're telling on yourself and your age if you know the name Paul Harvey, but... Growing up as a boy, my dad used to play him in the car, and I loved listening to Paul Harvey because nobody could tell a story like Paul Harvey could tell a story. And he would always build that great dramatic pause, and then he would say, and now for the rest of the story. You remember that? Well, when you come to verse 14 and verse 15, what you're coming to is, may I say, the rest of the story. Early this Lord's Day, we began, remember, the secret things of prayer, the secret things. Six times he says in secret in this passage. So what are the secrets? Everybody's looking for the secret. Pre preacher, show me the secret, all right? Jesus already showed us the secret. It's written down in black and white. George Whitfield, the great preacher of the Great Awakening, said, God condescended to become an author, and no, most people will never even read the book he wrote. That's pretty bad, isn't it? So here we are, black and white. God wrote a book on prayer. God said, if you want the secrets of connection with God, it's written right there in front of your face. What are the secrets? And we started this Lord's Day by looking at the secret place. And that's not so much about the geography, the circumstances, or the size of the room. It's really about our, our spiritually getting in tune with the Lord and giving God our undivided attention, getting on the same page with Him in step with the Holy Spirit. That's the secret place. Then we talked about some of the secrets of prayer that are found in this amazing model prayer that the Lord has given us as an example. But tonight, I want to talk to you about the secret principle. Would you write that down somewhere, the secret principle? And what is the secret principle? Well, in a word, it is the principle of forgiveness. Oh, wait a minute, preacher. You're not preaching on prayer tonight. Oh, yes, I'm preaching on prayer tonight. You see, the great principle that unlocks the storehouse of heaven is the principle found here in the word forgive. Did you notice that six times in this little short teaching on prayer, Jesus used the word forgive? Would you mark it in your Bible? Back up to verse number 12. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So, look, you've got the vertical and you've got the horizontal. You've got the Godward and you've got the manward. You've got... You've got the earthly relationships and you've got the eternal relationship. And what is to mark both of them? It is this word forgive. So mark it, please, in your Bible in verse 12. Forgive, forgive. And then again in verse 14, twice, forgive, forgive. And again in verse 15, twice, forgive, forgive. Almost like the Lord is trying to teach us something here. And the repetition of the word is important, but here's what I want you to see. He doesn't just build this 
request for forgiveness into the prayer in verse number 12, he goes back. He comes full circle back in verse 14 and 15 to elaborate on it a little further, almost like this is critical. Once you've marked that in your Bible, I'd like you to lift your head and look at me for just a moment because I want to say to you that I am convinced one of the reasons we have not had revival in our generation is unforgiveness. Not God's unforgiveness. No, there's no unforgiveness with him. He stands ready to forgive. Are you happy God is a God ready to forgive? How many of you have needed forgiveness today? I'm just curious. Yeah, so join the club, all right? And every day we need the Lord's forgiveness and God stands ready to forgive. The unforgiveness I'm talking about is not God's unforgiveness. It is our unforgiveness. Every evil fruit grows in the soil of unforgiveness. Every evil thing. In a church, if there is unforgiveness, I guarantee you, there are other problems. In a family, in a marriage with children, where there is unforgiveness, I'm telling you, you've opened the door to let all kinds of other evils in. In a mind, in a heart, anywhere there is unforgiveness, you've, you've given Satan a place. Remember, neither give place to the devil. He'll take any place you give him. He doesn't deserve any place in your life. But one of the ways that the Satan gets a place in us, a foothold, a, a toehold in us, is in this matter of unforgiveness. Oh, I'm convinced of it. I'm convicted by it. That in my travels, I meet people everywhere I go who have been forgiven, who've never learned to forgive. And they live in bitterness. My friend, the fruit of the Spirit never grows in the garden of unforgiveness, never. And we say we want the blessing of the Lord. We say we want answers to prayer. We say we want connection with heaven. We say we want everything God has for us. And yet, could it be that the thing holding back the blessing, hindering all of that, the dam that holds back the flood tide of God's best, is this matter of forgiveness. And we're coming right back to this passage, but take a little journey with me just for a second. I want to show you how important this is because it just keeps coming up in Scripture. Turn over a few pages in the Gospel according to Matthew, to Matthew chapter 18. Because Jesus told an amazing story to his disciples about this matter of forgiveness. It came from a question that Peter asked in Matthew 18, verse 21. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Peter must have thought he was pretty, pretty spiritual to say, I'll forgive for seven times. Then Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. I've heard some people preach this like this is a mathematical equation. Let me just tell you, God's math is a whole lot different than your math. And he's not giving a number here. He's giving a principle. This is not mathematical. This is spiritual. Let me tell you something about the divine forgiveness. There is no end to our God's forgiveness. And so he begins to tell this story. You know the story beginning in verse number 23 of the man who had the tremendous debt hanging over his head and was called to pay it. And when he could not pay it, he was going to have the judgment come on him and he pleaded for mercy. And look at verse number 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. What a picture that is of our salvation. Look, you were in bondage to sin. The, the, the sin debt was hanging over top of you. And God Almighty sent his own son to pay your sin debt. And when Jesus cried to tell us thy, it is finished from the cross, he literally was saying, your sin debt has been paid in full. And on that day, look at the verse. He had compassion on you. He loosed you. Anybody glad you're loosed from the debt? He forgave it. Verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which was nothing, by the way, especially compared to what he owed, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, <laughs> saying, pay me that thou owest. And, you know, we sit back and go, that's terrible. That's just terrible. I can't imagine doing such a thing. But just remember, we do the very same thing. I want you to remember, I want you to ponder just a moment how much you've been forgiven. All the sin debt canceled. Think about that. Think where you deserve to be today. Think where you would be if it wasn't for the mercy of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. He cast all your sins behind his back. He, he cast all your sins in the sea of his forgetfulness. My grandpa used to say, he put them in the sea of his forgetfulness, and then he posted a no fishing sign. I like that, don't you? It's done. It's over. And then what do we do? 
We get annoyed and aggravated and agitated with people who do us wrong. And instead of forgiving them, we hold over their heads some little tiny thing when all of hell has been forgiven in our life. I mean, let that sink in just a minute, the enormity of unforgiveness. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me. I'll pay thee all. And mark verse 30 in your Bible, and he would not. I'm thinking now of Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know, some of us who've been saved a little while have forgotten what it was like to be lost. That's our problem. Some of us have been in church our whole life, and we've forgotten what it was like when we were without God and without hope in the world. And after a while, we start thinking we deserve this. I want to remind everybody in this room, and I included this preacher, we don't deserve anything but the eternal fire of hell, and anything better than hell is better than every one of us ever deserved in our lives. Unforgiveness is always connected to ingratitude. Always. He would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant. You know, we want to talk about the wicked abortion crowd and the wicked immoral people and the wicked politicians and the wicked, you fill in the blank. What about our wickedness? God says unforgiveness, bitterness is wicked. Forget their wickedness a minute. The wickedness I'm most worried about is the wickedness that creeps subtly into my own soul. Oh, thou wicked servant. I forgave thee all that debt. Because thou desirest me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. May I tell you, there's a terrible torment to unforgiveness. And the torment is not for the person you didn't forgive, it's in you. And I have no idea who I'm preaching to. When I come to churches like this, I don't ask the preacher anything. I don't want to know. But somebody in this room is living in bondage tonight, and the reason you're living in bondage is because you have refused to forgive somebody else who did you wrong when you have been forgiven much more than that. And look at verse number 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if, doesn't that sound a lot like the verse a moment ago, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. And by the way, it can't just be word. It says from the heart. Sincerity, remember? Simplicity. From the heart. Turn over a few more pages in your Bible. We'll, we'll go back to our text in a minute. Go to Mark with me, Mark chapter 11. Here's another discussion Jesus had with his disciples. The context, again, is prayer. Look at Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus answering saith unto them, we like to quote this, have faith in God. That's a great verse, but keep reading. Verse 23, for verily, Mark 11, 23, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And I'm always hearing people talk about this, have faith in God and faith that moves mountains and believe and you will receive. And by the way, that's in the Bible, but don't stop there because Jesus Jesus didn't stop there. Look at verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Do this. I want you to mark in verse 24 the word believe, and in verse 25 the word forgive. If you want to get your prayers answered, there has to be faith and forgiveness. It's powerful. Somebody say, I'm trusting God, preacher. I'm really believing the Lord to answer this prayer, see something big happen. And yet they're harboring something against somebody else. I want you to know that your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God, and there is no way for the blessing to come apart from you meeting God's divine condition. In the New Testament, there's at least 10 conditions of answered prayer. This is one of them. There are many of them. Faith, praying in the will of God, on and on and on, a life of obedience. But here's, here's one of the ones we don't like to talk about. Maybe we don't want to talk about it because we want to harbor it. God says, if you don't forgive, you're not going to get your prayers answered. 
Hmm. Let me show you one more place. Go to the end of your New Testament, very close to the end, and come with me to 1 Peter for just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 3, this is in the context of family. By the way, that's where forgiveness has to start, at home. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. You remember back in Colossians, he said, Love your wives, don't be bitter against them. But don't miss the end of verse number 7. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, would you mark this in your Bible? 1 Peter 3, verse 7, that your prayers be not hindered. Do you understand your words to each other can hinder your words to God? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Somebody say, I know, preacher, I hurt her, I, I hurt him. No, you did more than that. You hurt your connection with the Lord. Look on, look at verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrise blessing, knowing that ye are there to call that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. See if this sounds familiar. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. You know, <laughs> Pastor, my experience has been when you come into a church and you preach against sins of the flesh, people, people are like, that's right, preacher, give it to them. I mean, preach on those sins of the flesh. And then you start preaching on the sins of the Spirit, and suddenly it, it's like, hmm. Now, you, I know that's in the Bible and everything, but... May I say that our sins of the Spirit are just as vile as their sins of the flesh. And they may be more destructive. All sin is destructive. Let me tell you why sins of the Spirit are so destructive. Because they're like a cancer that grows beneath the surface and corrupts and, and pervades every area of life. And you don't even see it until eventually little roots of bitterness start producing fruits in a person's life. And you say, what happened to that person? What's wrong with that person? Well, long before there was ever the outward signs of it, beneath the surface there was this root of bitterness and this root of unforgiveness. But I want to say to you, I think the greatest effect of unforgiveness, watch this please, is not what you get, it's what you miss. But the saddest thing about bitterness and what it does is not the terrible things that it produces, but the wonderful things God has for us that it keeps from us because you can't get your prayers answered and live consciously in the presence of God and have the peace of God ruling in your heart and mind when you are holding on to unforgiveness. So let's go back to our passage. Would you go back with me quickly to Matthew 6? And let me give you two or three thoughts from these verses. Number one, I want you to notice the circumstances. <laughs> we live in the circumstances, don't we? Aren't you glad our God's a realist? He knows right where we live, right what we have to deal with. And look at the circumstances found in verse 14 and verse 15. You ready for this? You're a sinner and so is everybody else. That's the circumstances. You know, we start out with such idealism, don't we? And it's all going to be perfect. Life's going to be perfect. And then you live a little while and you get smacked in the face a couple times and a gut punch or two and the air knocked out of you. And if you're not careful, I'll tell you what happens. Your idealism turns to cynicism. Pardon me. You become a sour old person. You get crit critical. You start talking about how bad everybody is and how bad the world is. And by the way, there is a lot of bad in this world. But God's people need to stop talking about how bad the world is and start talking about how good God is again. That's what we need to do. Somebody say, well, preacher, I don't know why we have all this to deal with. All right, I'm going to give you the reason. Theologically, you ready? Because you're a sinner surrounded by other sinners living on a sin-cursed planet. And man that is born a woman is a few days and full of trouble, and that's not going to change till Jesus comes and changes everything. Isn't that going to be a glorious day? But until that day, here's the, here's the circumstance you have to live in. You have to live in the fact that you are a sinner and you are dealing with other sinners. Matter of fact, mark the particular word he uses for sin here because every word means something. Here he uses the word trespasses. Would you mark that in your Bible? Do you see it? Repeatedly, trespasses. It's, very closely akin to the word transgress in the Bible. On our little farm in the mountains of West Virginia, it was my grandfather's farm really, we live at. Uh, Dad has posted around the property at certain places along the property lines these signs. You know what they say up on the tree. What do they say? Know what? Yeah. 
What does that mean? It means it's not your property. Stay out. Don't trespass. Don't cross this line. Watch this, please. When God says that there are trespasses, what does it mean? He means I've drawn some lines, I've given some laws, and somewhere you cross that line. Look, please. Sin is falling short of God's glory. Trespass is going beyond God's law. So in both cases, we fall short of perfection, and we go beyond his holiness. We go beyond his holy law. So let's take a survey tonight, all right? How many of you ever did anything wrong in your whole life? Would you raise your hand, please? Let me ask a different question. How many of you have ever had anybody do you wrong? By the way, if you didn't raise your hand the first time, you just lied and you did sin. And if you didn't raise your hand the second time, you're just not thinking about it or you haven't lived long enough, but sometimes somebody's going to do you wrong. And the reality is that all of us have this circumstance with which to deal. And here's what I've discovered, that most of the time, most of us, are easy on ourselves and hard on others. And it ought to be the exact opposite. God's children ought to be harder on themselves than they are anybody. They ought to hold themselves to a certain standard, but they ought to be merciful to other people. Oh, dear dear ones, think for just a moment how patient and merciful God has been with us. I've been pondering a word recently. It's a great Bible word. We don't use it much anymore. But it is this word, long-suffering. So like, what's that word mean, preacher? Chop it in half, turn it around, and say it the other way. He suffers long. You ever think about what God puts up with from us? Let me just tell you, I am really glad you're not God, and you ought to be glad I'm not God. Because if we were God, we'd squash each other like bugs every day. But what does God do? He suffers long with us. His mercy endureth forever. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Aren't you glad? We may be bound by circumstances, but God is not bound by circumstances. So you notice the circumstance. And then a second thing. Would you mark this down, please? God reveals the condition. Uh, Yes, there is the reality of trespasses, sins you commit, and sins that are committed against you. But please don't miss the condition to answered prayer. He uses this word if. Would you circle it in verse 14, if? And in verse 15, the word if. God says, if you want the blessing, this is what you have to do. It's one of the if-then promises of Scripture. The reality is I can't choose for you and you can't choose for me. Everyone must choose for themselves. And as I was meditating on these verses this week, I noticed something. Do you know what the emphasis of these verses is on? Not on the person who did you wrong. That's fascinating to me. The emphasis of these two verses is on two people. Listen to me, church. If you can boil all of life down to these two people, you'll be all right. You say, who are the two people? Glad you asked. Look at them, please. First of all, there's you. If ye... Verse 14, verse 15, if ye, you might even want to write in the margin of your Bible, ye means me. God gets real personal with every one of us. So I'm not preaching to a group. Oh, I'm preaching to a group tonight. But the Holy Spirit is speaking to individuals and ministering to you right where you are and whoever it is you need to forgive and whatever it is you need to get over and whatever it is in your past that you need to get past, God's dealing with you individually. So you've got to be honest with God yourself. But here's the second main character in the setting. Look at it, please. In verse 14 and verse 15, would you mark your father? It's powerful. Instead of majoring on the offender, instead of majoring on the offense, what does Jesus do? He boils all of life down to this. It's you and God. Oh, church, listen to me. If you can get it down to you and God, God can help you deal with anybody and anything else. Your relationship to people is contingent on your nearness to God. And it's interesting to me, who's the one doing the talking? Who's, who's talking? If you have a red letter edition Bible, you know. Who's doing the talking? Jesus. You know who Jesus is? The greatest forgiver of them all. Look at him on that cross. Look at him. It's midnight in the middle of the day as God the Father turns his back on his own son and a cry pierces the darkness. Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer is he was forsaken so we could be forgiven. In fact, the very first prayer from the cross, the very first utterance from the cross, these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How did forgiveness reach 
from a holy God to desperate fallen humanity? The answer is through Jesus. On that cross, he took God in one hand and us in the other and made a way so that the two could come together again. What a great Savior we have. And who is he speaking of? The Father. <laughs> May I tell you who the Heavenly Father is? He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He is, he is the Father who forgives more than any father ever has. You talk about a perfect father. And may I say to you, hear me with your heart right now, you are never more like your father than when you are forgiving. People say, I want to be Christ-like preacher. I really want to be like the Lord. I want to be more like God. All right, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Start forgiving because you are never more like God than when God is, than when you're forgiving because that's what God does all the time. He's just always forgiving. You know, children ought to bear resemblance in some way to their fathers. <laughs> if you come to our hometown... And somebody would say to me, are you Roger Pollock, boy? Yes. It's unmistakable. I look like him, talk like him, act like him. He's my daddy. Uh, that, that has uh, helped me stay out of some messes through the years. Uh, helped me get out of a speeding ticket once. That was a beautiful thing. I was just a teenager driving through our plaza in our hometown. A guy pulled me over. My, my mother and sister were in the car with me. My mother said to me, you're going to get a ticket. No sooner were the words out of her mouth than the siren went on. She's a prophetess, you know, spoke evil into my life. And my sister was in the back seat laughing her head off. the greatest day of her life. And we, we pulled over in this empty parking lot, and a guy came up. He was rough. He was rough, man. Didn't smile, not nice. Took my license and registration, went back to the car and back there a little bit. And he came back up, looked at my license and looked at me, looked at my license, looked at me. He said, are you Roger Pauly's boy? Whew. I thought, I wonder if he knew my dad before he got saved or after he got saved. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I am. He smiled at me. Handed me my license back, kind of winked and said, slow it down, son. Have a good day. I heard angelic choirs sing the hallelujah chorus. It was wonderful. That resemblance, that name, that connection to my father. See, it, it changed the whole dynamic. Do you understand that every good thing in your life is because you are connected to the heavenly father? And do you understand that every good thing that other people see in your life must not be you? Because in you and your flesh dwelleth no good thing. If there's any good thing in you, it must be the nature and character of God being formed in your life. And I wonder, does anybody look at you and think of God? Does anybody hear you speak and watch you respond and think of God in our actions and reactions and in what we say and how we say it, would anybody say, I think that person knows God. I, I think that person is a person of grace. I think that person is a merciful person. Would anyone think of God when they see us? See, the greater issue is not just what others think, it's what God knows. And the condition answered prayer is, you've got to forgive, friends. And there's a third truth, and this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Or shall we say, this is where the rubber slides all over the road. This is, this is where it gets tough. Would you write it down? Because God not only points out the circumstance and the condition, but then he gives the choice. Did you ever notice that in these verses, though, though it is in the imperative, it implies a command, God gives room where you have to decide you got to choose. So you can choose, if you want to, to harbor unforgiveness and bitterness all of your life, or you can choose to lay it aside and give it to God and put it under the blood of Jesus and move forward, but you've got to make the decision. Look, this is a wonderful church, and you got a faithful pastor. Aren't you glad you got a faithful shepherd in this church? But I want you to know this congregation can't choose for you, and that pastor can't choose for you. You must choose for yourself whether you're going to forgive and be a person of prayer or not. It's up to you. And the real issue, this is so practical, is it's really not about what you know. It's about what you do with what you know. So we sit here all day today and we study this whole passage about prayer and we take good notes and we nod our heads and we say, that's good, that's good, yeah, I like that, that's good. And then we go right out this week and we live in bitterness and we hold on to things that we ought not hold on to and we cannot get our prayers answered and after a while we think, well, that must not be for me, that didn't work for me. And the devil lies to you and you believe his lie and go on living a substandard, weak, anemic, mediocre, nominal, half-hearted Christian faith, subpar below what Jesus said you could have as one of the Father's children and all the while it was contingent on this. What will you choose for yourself? I travel every week in my life, every week, almost every week, getting on and off airplanes. That gets monotonous after a while, but 
One of the things I learned as a traveler is, are you ready for this? Travel light. Travel light. Guy picked me up at the airport the other day. I was going to be in a place, whatever it was, three or four days. And he says, is that all you got? Yeah. I don't travel with much. That little roller board in my briefcase, I mean, I can live days and days and days with that. Now, when I first started traveling, I took a lot more. And you know what I figured out? It took me a whole long time to get ready to go. It took me a lot of labor to get there. And then it took me a lot of labor to try to get back with all that junk. And I figured something out. I don't need all that junk. You know what I discover? Most travelers are traveling far heavier than they're supposed to. You want something fun? I'll tell you, look, come go with me tomorrow. I'll be in two or three airports tomorrow. Come go with me tomorrow. Let's sit in the terminals. It's better than TV, I promise you, and just watch people go by. And you watch these people, and you always pretty much pick the people that don't travel very often because they're laden down with all this stuff. I mean, you think they're moving to China for the month, you know? And then it's going for three days. They don't need all that junk. You know what I've discovered? You say, why are you saying all that, preacher? Because most people on the journey of life are carrying a whole bunch of baggage God never intended you to carry, and you can't carry it on your own. It's time to travel light. Some of you need to take something tonight or someone and lay them on the altar and give them to God and say, I'm not living that way anymore. I'm not carrying that anymore. I'm casting that care on the Lord. But that is a choice you will have to make. Look at our verses again, would you please? Verse 14 and 15. Four. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I want to say praise God for that. But you can't claim the promise if you won't apply the principle. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Listen, you can't blame it on somebody else, and you can't expect God to overlook your sin. Neither are going to happen. Instead, you've got to take personal responsibility. You can't choose for everybody, but you must choose for you. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.